You're listening to. Whoa! Potluck. And hey, welcome to Books and Boba, a book club and podcast featuring books by Asian and Asian American authors. My name is Marvin Yue. And I'm Rira Yu. And we are here today for our May 2024 mid month check in episode where we go over the latest Asian American related book and publishing news uh, for this um, Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. As always, Books and Boba is supported in part by our patrons. Um, so if you'd like to become a bigger part of our podcast, we encourage you to join and gain access to um, our members-only Discord server, as well as a monthly bonus podcast. So definitely check us out over at patreon.com slash books and boba. Um, before we get started, how has your um, Asian month been going, Rira? Um, it's been pretty good. I like because I'm not organizing any like events, I guess. Um, <laughs> it's been pretty chill for me, but I know that's not the case for most of our colleagues. This is the one month where we get just flooded with requests from um, other companies and stuff. So I'm guessing you've been pretty busy too, because you have a film festival that you've been um, well, helping. That ended last week. So I've actually had a pretty chill week. Um, a lot of my APAM this year is pretty front loaded. Um, the rest of the month looks pretty chill. Um, just you know, I have some things on my to do list for the month. Um, namely, I need to create some mood boards for our Asian Book Challenge 2024. Oh, that's right. That has been something that I've been doing and keeping busy <laughs> with. Yeah. Thank you to everyone who's been participating. Um, it's been really cool to see your creative mood boards for recommending books by Asian authors. Um, Rira's been putting out a lot of really good ones. Um, you, you've been getting seen by the authors. Uh, how does that feel? I mean, why would I not get seen by the authors? I, I tag them. Um, <laughs> but I had a lot of fun making those mood boards. I I guess it's because I'm a very visual person that um, it, it just came like much, like it came easily to me. It's just... Um, narrowing down all of the photos that I've collected into my folder because there's a lot and I can only like squeeze in maybe like nine. Um, but yeah, I'm really happy that the authors are like thrilled to see the mood boards. They're like, oh my gosh, this is exactly the vibe of the book. And I'm like, yes, nailed it. I love it. Do you have yeah. any books in mind, Marvin? For... I have a couple that I'm thinking of, but um, we did make a kind of a policy decision that will be um, creating mood boards for newer books. Uh, and so I, I need to reevaluate yeah, yeah. my list because I have a lot of old books under that. I just like, yeah, I always... like, I mean, the reason, the reason why I said that was like, I don't want to keep recommending the same books that we've had, like in our previous challenges, because, um, people already know about those books and it's better to, uh, recommend like newer books from like 2023 and 2024. Yeah, but I really wanted to make the Jade City mood board. What, Jade City? <laughs> but you've, like, recommended that in, like, almost every single interview that we've done with other publications. Uh, you've used it for past prompts. So I think it is now time for you to uh, <laughs> move on from Jade City being your to-go recommendation. Mm. I'm sorry, Marvin. I know that it is your favorite series, but we need to keep up with the times. Huh. You know, right. I'll keep thinking on it. <laughs> um, while I do that, um, this is our mid-month book news check-in. Uh, and as always, we start off our episode by going over the latest Asian American publication announcements um, collected this month by Rira from various sources online, including Publishers Weekly and social media. Um, so, yeah, let's get started. Uh, Rira. What is our first book deal? All right. So our first book deal is Random House Acquired Immortal the Blood, first in a new YA fantasy series by Molly X. Chang, the author of Two Gays Upon Wicked Gods. Pitched as Mulan meets Helen of Troy with vampires, the series follows a young woman who is destined for greatness but finds herself caught between two princes and a prophecy she never wanted. Publication will begin in summer 2025. Woo, Mulan meets Greek mythology. This sounds <laughs> like something that I would really enjoy. And also there's vampires mixed in with it. So very eclectic mix right yeah. here. Maybe like a, some sort of immortal conflict because Helen Troy, that was the the queen that was that started the, the Trojan War, right? Uh, I wouldn't say she started the Trojan War. I think the men 
well, involved. I mean, sorry, the, the Trojan, Trojan War, that, but like, she is the she is the it. she is the face that launched a thousand ships. Yes. <laughs> yeah, this sounds cool. You know, like combining two epics and adding vampires to it. I dig that. I think you know, extrapolating from the title and the fact that there are vampires, this is probably going to be like a, a era spanning fantasy story, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm guessing that's what it is. I I like. I dig. Yeah. So congratulations to Molly on the book deal. Um, it definitely checks a lot of our boxes. So definitely keep an eye on it. Um, as it comes out next year. All right, our next deal, Disney Hyperion bought Maggie and the Story Shadows, a middle-grade adventure by Joe Whitmore, um, writing as Annabelle O, pitched as Land of Stories meets Only Murders in the Building. The book follows 13-year-old Maggie and her friends as they investigate Maggie's mother's disappearance through a mysterious realm of folklore, turning their misadventures into a hit web series along the way. Publication is slated for fall 2025. So Joe Whitmore is um, an author of a bunch of tween humor series, uh, including Confidentially Yours, uh, Odd Girl In, and D is for Drama. So this seems like a a bit of a departure from her usual writing because it is more of an adventure story. So I can I can see why she would pick a pen name to. Uh, <laughs> you know, kind of change the feel of of her writing style, I guess. I do love the conceit of like, hey, we're going on an adventure in the magical lands, like Narnia, but for like, I guess, Gen Zers, right? Like, let's let's make a TikTok of our adventures in Narnia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I, I was just like, wait, what? Like TikTok? But then I, I looked at the premise again and it says hit web series along the way. So I was like, oh, okay, like a TikTok live stream or I guess like the newer version of iCarly, whatever streaming is now for for this generation. God, I sound so old. Yeah. All right. Our next book deal is Abrams Appleseed bought world rights to the Big Jobs for Little Babies board book series written by Katrina Moore and illustrated by Benson Shum. Rhyming interactive text and gatefolds explore several professions centered around an activity that baby loves to do. The first two books in the series, Who's Digging and Who's Building, will publish in fall 2025 and spring 2026. Yeah, we're definitely not the right demographic for this, but um, yeah, I can totally see uh, a lot of parents wanting uh, wanting these books. Yeah, it's like vocational training for babies. Start them young, t- teach them about um jobs in the i guess construction and architecture business i mean like what do babies like to do they like to put things in their mouths so i guess an occupation for that would be i don't know food blogger (laughs) yeah sounds a good time especially when everything rhymes um okay Next up, um, in an exclusive submission, Viking acquired X Marks the Spot by Gloria Chow. Um, and that's X with an EX. Um, the book is about a teen who discovers a puzzle in her estranged grandfather's will, then embarks on an inheritance hunt that will take her through Taiwan and force her to work with her ex, only to find that her family has hidden more than treasure. Publication is scheduled for spring 2025. We've had Gloria Chow on our show before. She is the author of When You Wish Upon a Lantern, which we talked about on uh, on our uh, author chat with her. And she's also the author of American Panda. So uh, she has written a slew of uh, great YA romance novels. Um, and I love the fact that this is a treasure hunt and... Uh, I don't know what the relationship was was like for the main character and her estranged grandfather. I don't know like why they're estranged, but I think it's quite funny that the grandfather is like, "Yeah, you need to work for my money. Like you need to you need to solve uh, solve these puzzles or whatever." It kind of like reminds me of the Da Vinci Code. Yeah, or like National Treasure, like just one of yeah, those, National Treasure. Like, you know. One grandfather's clue treasure next clue and you're like discovering all this hidden history that you didn't know um i love that she is also sticking with um the the pun <laughs> both the pun and also the enemies to lovers um trope that she also had with uh, when you wish upon a lantern um i think now, that wasn't really enemies to lovers though that was more like childhood friends who had an unfortunate misunderstanding and was in a strained relationship to lovers not straight up enemies to lovers. It was a different flavor. Um, but this is really cool. I I can't imagine like working with an ex on such a uh, such a like time consuming, grueling adventure, uh, such as like 
hunting for your grandfather's treasure? Like, are you going to promise them half of the treasure that belongs to your family? Like, what's the deal here? Very interested in finding out. Yeah. All right. Next up, Lee and Lo bought world rights to children's clinical psychologist Halle Masi's middle grade novel, Harry Man's Suit. The book is about Hanga May Harriet Mansour, who is having the worst month of her 13 year old Iranian American life. But she and her frustrating older sister might have to get along just this once to turn things around. Publication is planned for spring 2026. What is the worst month of a 13-year-old Iranian-American girl? Hmm, I don't know. What do you think it is? In my head, I'm like, your period? (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. Uh, Something must be really bad if you're going to team up with your uh, sister that you don't really get along with. Um, I have even less experience in that stuff, so I I really don't have much to add. I think it's really cool that this book is written by a clinical psychologist. It's really interesting to see people who, um, actually have like a, like a professional background in how children's brains work and they write like a book where, um, they can kind of like enrich the younger reader's mind. So, um, yeah, it's pretty, it's a pretty cool career pivot. Yeah, congrats on the book deal. Um, okay, next up, Coca-Cola bought world rights to Gui, The Hungry Ghost, written by Emily Lee and illustrated by Basia Tran. Inspired by the Hungry Ghost Festival and spirits of Chinese mythology, the picture book follows Gui, a ghost who eats and eats but never feels full until an unlikely friend helps him discover that fulfillment can come in surprising ways. Publication is slated for spring 2026. Hungry Ghost Festival. I feel like we've been seeing more books on it uh, lately. And um, I don't uh, know about Hungry Ghost Festival. We've been seeing a lot of books about Tomb Sweeping Hungry Festival, Ghosts. which is a different festival. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> See, not all Asians are alike because clearly I, I don't know every single Asian holiday slash festival. Yeah. I mean, there are so many festivals in Chinese culture, um, because there's so many different cultures that encompass, you know, China and Asia. I mean, I'm not sure if you're the same way as me, but for a lot of like Chinese culture and festivals, I rely on my parents to tell me what to do and where to go. Um, even now, yeah, we mentioned adult. this a couple. Yeah. yeah, we've mentioned this a couple times in previous episodes. Yeah, like we, as as diasporans, we kind of get our culture secondhand through our parents, and it's it's hard to keep track of all of the festivals and when we do celebrate it here in the states um it's a little bit different from how the motherland celebrates it yeah and especially now that festivals are like being portrayed in media i feel like a lot of i don't know sometimes it just feels like when mainstream culture especially like mainstream american culture gets a hold of it it just waters everything down too right it's just, um so yeah i yeah um but you know the concept of the hungry ghost is um as I think we understand it from reading The Ghost Bride um, by Yansing Chu is, you know, ghosts that are, you know, in, in Chinese culture, we offer offerings to our, our ancestors, right? Through the form of like leaving food on altars and things like that. Um, and hungry ghosts are ghosts who are forgotten either because they've died so long ago or that their family is you know too poor or like refuse to leave offerings and they become, you know, wandering ghosts looking for um, satisfaction. So in a way, this, this picture book, has a pretty like horrifying premise, right? Um, but I'm sure it's like, I'm sure. But you it's make friends with the hungry way. ghost. Like it's gonna be a wholesome friendship. I believe in this Casper Lydia uh, parallel friendship right here. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I'm just taking like a shot in the dark because obviously, yeah. like, I'm sure it'll be book. cute because it is a picture book. And Gui, Gui is just a Chinese word for ghost. So it's a, that's cute cle- though. It's a clever name. Um, it is a clever name. Yeah. All right. Next up, Peach Tree Teen bought In the Country I Love by debut author Allah Al Barkawi. This multi POV contemporary YA novel explores the complexities of friendship, grief, and family through the story of two Iraqi American best friends, a teen single father whose Shia Muslim faith has lapsed, and the community's devout golden boy. Before, during, and after a crime that will alter their lives and unearth dark truths their families have worked to keep hidden. Publication is set for summer 2026. 
Yeah, like I was really surprised that this was a YA novel because just judging from like the la- the layers of themes like friendship, grief, and family, um, and also like the layer of crime that's in the story as well, I thought this was a literary novel for adults. So very surprising that it's for teens. Yeah, I'm um, definitely getting that too. Like this book definitely has like literary fiction vibes, you know, like digging into like on the surface a picture perfect community to find like the 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 cracks underneath right yeah so it sounds like this book will it'll probably be a, a lot of things so looking forward to I'm um, learning more about it congrats to Allah on their book deal um next up Philomel bought the first two books in the I and Ico series by Singapore based artist Peter Draw based on his characters I and Ico which have over 63 billion views via Giphy. Um, the first picture book, I and Ico and the Little Curve, finds I drawing self-portraits of his grandpa, but there's a very important curve missing from I's work. So he and his fluffy dog, Ico, journey out into the world to find the elusive curve, his smile. Publication is set for summer 2025. Oh, this sounds so cute. Trying to find uh, the grandfather's smile. <laughs> you know, when I draw, back when I used to draw, like, Faces were just actually, you know, everything was hard. I'm not good at drawing. Um, <laughs> I will say, if you are someone who draws, like I think most people will agree with me that hands are the hardest parts to draw, but um, smiles are also pretty hard too, pretty tricky. Um, just you know, finding like the right angle for the lines, it's it's and you know, it'll make a great difference. <laughs> um, and I'm sure Peter draw knows that as like someone who draws a bunch of stuff <laughs> draws a bunch of uh characters i've never heard of i and Ico, um but the fact that it has over one billion le- i mean like let alone 63 billion views that's that's very impressive i think it's really cute when kids are doing like uh draw like portraits of their relatives i still have a portrait that my nephew drew uh, when he was like three years old of Dan, because like Dan was like the first uh, white person he had ever met in his uh, entire three years of living <laughs> on this planet. So it was very cute. And um, yeah, there's just something special about the way kids see their family members and how it's reflected in their art. Yeah. All right. Next up, Dial bought Pinna's Dalgona by debut author illustrator So Jung Kim McCarthy. Inspired by the author's experience of being an immigrant and learning English as a second language, the picture book follows Pinna, who can't wait to tell her friends about making Talgona by herself for the first time, but finds her words are mixed up. Publication is planned for summer 2025. Okay, so Talgona became super popular during the pandemic when people were trapped in their houses and they were uh, experimenting with not just cooking, but also like drink mixing and talgona is pretty much you get instant coffee and you like use like a mixer and it becomes like this very fluffy caramelized treat and talgona cookies which is very very old in korean culture um it's pretty much like sugar and a little bit of baking soda and then you put it like over a fire and you keep stirring until it becomes like caramelized that's the cookie from squid game right yeah, it was featured in Squid Game. That's what most people um, kind of like tie it into. Like that, that That's what most people think of when they hear Talguna. Um, but Talguna has been a, around for a long time in Korean culture. Yeah, I mean, I can see why. Because I have not made Talguna. But oh, I've, me neither. I've never made it. I've watched and people I'm make Korean. it, and it seems very, um, you know, labor intensive. And I'm sure it's not though. It's really easy, <laughs> but it's really easy to mess up. That's another thing. Yeah, which is why I can see why a kid would be super excited to share that they succeeded in making this thing. Um, I think it's cute that um, you know this book follows them as they try to deal with a language barrier. Um, I think it's, you know, we still have a, a, a lot of children coming into this country, like dealing with English as a second language. So having some, you know, representation for them to show that they're, you know, again, both that their experiences are are valid and also to teach other kids like, hey, don't make fun of your classmate for not speaking English well yet. Uh, I think that's, that's, those are good lessons to teach. You know, like as 
uh, as a Korean, like I actually didn't know uh, the term talgona because I knew it as a different term. I mm-hmm. knew it as popki, which is an older uh, name for talgona. And uh, talgona and popki are from like the Seoul and Incheon region. So even though it's like pretty much the same, um, I guess like district in a way, same region, uh, different ways to call it. Other regions in Korea call it something different, like kukja, chokja, degi, digi. So it's like, talgona is so different from all the other uh, regional terms for it. So it, it was kind of confusing to me when uh, Squid Game showed up and they were calling it talgona. And I was like, what is that? <laughs> oh, it's bopki. Okay. All right. That's, that's weird. <laughs> So, like, language. Language is, yeah. um, yeah. I mean, my wife and I compare, like, our Chinese all the time because we have different terms for different things because our family is from different regions of, like, Asia. Like, um, her family is from northern China. Uh, My family is from Taiwan by way of southern China. And so we have a lot of um, of different terms for even things like trash. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's not even just like learning English as a second language. It's like your your first language can also be very complicated and have like different terms for everything. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's a very relatable story. <laughs> That's what Jung wrote. All right. Next up, Delacorte Romance acquired "As Long as You Loathe Me" by Swati Hegde, pitched as "Never Have I Ever Meets Mean Girls." This sapphic rivals to lovers romance follows a girl who tries to get back at her ex-best friend for stealing her crush, but ends up rekindling their complicated friendship and discovering that it's not just her pride on the line, it's her heart too. Publication is slated for spring 2026. Let me just say, Swati did a great job with the title, As Long As You Loathe Me, a reference to Backstreet Boys, As Long As You Love Me, and (laughs) her previous novel, Match Me If You Can, as in like, Catch Me If You Can, so I love it. Love a author who loves a good pun. Yeah. Oh my goodness. This sounds like so much fun. Um, I don't know why. Maybe it's because Mean Girls has been made into a movie musical, but I immediately thought of this book as a musical. And I think it would have been so fun if that would be it would be so fun if it got adapted into into a musical. <laughs> but yeah. uh yeah. Wow, ex best friend stealing stealing your best friend's crush is a big no no. <laughs> that's yeah. against girls code yeah um love that uh one of the references is never have it ever which means that there's there's gonna be a lot of um i guess what the kids say cringe in this book never have i ever i don't know if you've watched never have i ever but it features one of the most messy um teen protagonists in like media of i all have time. not watched it but i have seen clips from it and i do cringe at some of the things <laughs> that i have seen so yeah, it's yeah. great. I think you would. I don't know if you would love it. I love it. If Davy is what um, this protagonist is modeled after, we're we're in for a good time. Uh, but yeah, congrats to um, Swati on the book deal. All right. Next up, in a six house auction and a two book deal, Dial acquired world rights to "The Vastness of Us," written by Teresa Siagatonu and illustrated by Luciola Langi. The picture book is about a Samoan girl who, at school, is presented with a world map that is at odds with her own understanding of her ancestral homeland, one where the Pacific Islands are barely perceptible and the Pacific Ocean is sliced in half. But with the help of her grandpa, she's reminded that there is nothing small about the islands of Oceania. Publication is planned for fall 2025. First off, I I love this idea. I mean, it's not it's not an idea because it definitely happens in classrooms today um where the world map which obviously like we live we live through times of colonialism and imperialism and we definitely see that in our maps today i i love this idea of um, a kid from the pacific islander community who's like who goes to a regular school and she's kind of confronted with colonialism and imperialism in this very like small but uh, very impactful way yeah i mean I'm kind of reading this um, less. I mean, there's definitely shades of colonialism probably in there. Um, But just the fact that, you know, to a child, 
like the world that you know is so big, right? Like when I was growing up, you know, I grew up in the suburbs of LA, but I never ventured into like west of downtown, right? My world was my town, right? And you know, in the grand scheme of things, my town is tiny, but for a kid, that, that town is huge. So I think um, for me, I'm reading it, that's what's happening here. It's like this, the world that she thought was like huge in the grand scheme of the world map is just a relatively small island, right? Because I'm assuming this is taking place in modern day. So like the maps are drawn like confirmed through satellites these days, right? Yeah, I, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. But I guess it could be, it, it is very like discouraging when, you know, like your homeland is, you know, very, very small geographically and it barely shows up on the map. And it's like, or or it doesn't even show up on the map because the map is like so enlarged. So who knows? Yeah. And I'm sure being like a kid in like a classroom, like maybe being the only Samoan kid in there, like, the other kids are probably mean about it, you know? Like, kids can say really mean and thoughtless things, especially at the expense of others. So, yeah. I mean, I like that this book encourages kids to be proud of their culture and heritage, you know? Like, you don't have to compare yourself to others and where other people are from, you know? Like, where you're from is just as important. I think that's a really good lesson to teach um, teach kids. Yeah, I mean, think about it. England is tiny, but the British Empire was very big and it makes you question like does size matter not really in the in the end no um, um, weapons technology that's what matters um, yeah yeah all right uh next up flamingo books bought world rights to sparkles for sunny a lunar new year story written by sylvia chen and illustrated by tai mai Fong. a picture book about a girl who was tired of wearing a hand-me-down chi pao to the lunar new year parade and takes matter into her own hands to make hers and her sister's cheap house on their own. Publication is planned for fall 2025. Yes, I love this Project Runway Lunar New Year edition. Um, Sounds super cute. As a Korean American, obviously our Lunar New Year festivals are very different from um, Chinese and Vietnamese Lunar New Year festivals. I mean, do do people wear cheap house? Like, like is that is that something that is, I guess, like commonly worn in during during the holiday? No, it's, (laughs) it comes down to, again, like being a part of like a diaspora culture sometimes means that your culture kind of gets flattened. And so, you know, Chi Pao, while, you know, a form of Chinese fashion has become a signifier of Chinese culture, um, which is why you see them a lot in like these Lunar New Year celebrations, right? Oh, maybe they're part of the parade and that's why they're wearing a Chi Pao. Yeah, maybe. But, you know, as far as I know, like wearing sheep belt isn't necessarily like ceremonial dress for the new year, but because it's become like an iconic representation of like Chinese culture, it somehow also became essentially ceremonial dress for like Asian American celebrations of Lunar New Year. That's par for the course for diasporan culture. Uh, But nevertheless, I really like this idea of, you know, making your own clothes, make like making your own clothes uh, special. And, you know, I feel like because the title of the book is Sparkles for Sunny, I'm guessing that, you know, we see some glitter on on the clothes. And um, I don't know. Customization is always like really cute when kids do it. Yeah. All right. So our last book deal is Barefoot Books Acquired World Rights to Ramadan on Rama Road, Celebrating Food, Family and Friendship, written by Razina Omar Guta, the author of Hana's Hundreds of Hijabs and food blogger Faiza Osman. In this narrative cookbook, the diverse families of Rama Road prepare dishes for their annual potluck iftar. 24 global recipes are included. The book will be illustrated by Atiyah Sorabi, the illustrator of Soraya and the Yeti. Publication is set for spring 2025. Yeah, um, iftar. Iftar is the fast-breaking after Ramadan. Yeah, I do like that... um... A narrative cookbook sounds really cool. It's I feel like a lot of cookbooks these days um, have a lot of storytelling in it, right? And I think it's cool that as you're teaching people how to make these cultural dishes that you also give them context. I think, you know, food is like an easy vector to like share culture. Yeah, yeah. And also if you're sharing family recipes, there's definitely going to be stories about it, you know, like how... Uh, how far the tradition goes and also like how you learned how to cook from like your mother, your grandmother or like uh, your father or grandfather. And it's there's something really special about sharing that story with strangers who might not be familiar with your own culture. Yeah. 
All right, that'll do it for our publication announcements for May 2024. Uh, let's check in on some of the latest book news. Um, Mira, what's going on with awards? First up is the Barnes and Noble Children's and YA Award, and um, the overall winner was A Royal Conundrum: The Misfits by Lisa Yi and uh, Dan Santad as the illustrator. And it is about a group of crime-fighting underdog misfits at the strangest boarding school ever, a former castle-turned-prison that's now a reforming art school. And there's a heist, and it's supposed to be very adventurous. And um, yeah, uh, congratulations to Lisa Yi and Dan Santat. And the picture book winner was I Lived Inside a Whale by Shin Lee, which is a story about a little girl in search of silence and the lesson she learns when she finds it with fantastical illustrations. So congratulations to Shin Lee. Yeah, congrats to all the authors. Always cool to see um, our Asian authors winning these awards. And hopefully it's a good sign for award season going forward. All right, our next um, new story. Um Ria, what's, what's going on with Book Talk? Yeah, this is a little bit more of like a general news, not really specifically Asian American, but I was really curious to, uh, you know, uh, hear your thoughts, Marvin. So this trend, not trend, but this topic came about because a teacher recently spoke out about seeing fifth graders reading uh, spicy books like Icebreakers and a couple of Colleen Hoover novels and... Um, a lot of book talkers and even booktubers were talking about how um, is it okay for spicy adult books to have cute illustrated covers uh, because, like, doesn't it confuse parents into thinking that uh, these books are safe for younger readers? And I was just curious to to hear your thoughts, Marvin, as someone who has read a couple of uh, romance novels for this podcast. I mean, my thoughts are I don't think kids should be reading those books. Um, but kids are going to read what they want to read and they're going to read what book talk tells them to read, right? Um, I mean, kids are becoming more exposed to adult things a lot earlier these days. You know, like kids are wearing makeup a lot earlier these days. Um, I don't know if they're going to be able to absorb everything they, they read in those romance books. Um, but I think this is like, like when you have kids... Like, we're talking fifth graders, right? Yeah, fifth graders. fifth graders. And also younger, too. Like, fourth graders like, and third graders. And I'm like, I, That's Yo. on the parents for not, like, reading the book jackets on the books that their kids bring them, right? Because at that yeah. age, you shouldn't be re- you shouldn't be able to buy, like, books on your own. Unless you're saying it's like a book fair, right? But, like, school book fairs aren't going to be carrying these books. So these are books that are coming from either they're ordering online or they're going to, like, your Barnes & Nobles or local bookstores and picking them up. And, like, asking the parents for money to buy it. So, I mean, to me, it sounds like maybe parents should be more involved in, like, knowing what their kids are reading, too. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Especially when you consider how, like, they're not in the same section, even. Like, if you saw the kiss quotient in, like, the YA section, that I would highly like judge the booksellers there being like what are you doing this like this this is a book with a lot of sex in it and it's about like an a male escort that is like teaching a a grown-ass woman how to you know how to date and all that stuff so i'm just like that's not really fourth grade fifth grade or even like high school material in my opinion those books are in a totally different section so these kids are going to those sections to get these books but also like like i love the illustrated covers for a lot of these romance novels and um but if you compare them to like middle grade and ya illustrated covers i feel like they're slightly different because um for like the romance ones they're the characters are usually kissing or they're like embracing so it's very clear that it's not for younger readers so i do agree that it kind of falls in the falls into the responsibility of the parents to kind of pay attention to what their kids are reading. I mean, at the um, same time, if the kids are already exposed to these books, they're going to find them no matter what. They're probably getting them from their older friends or siblings, finding them in their parents' bookshelves. Yeah, I mean, AO3 like, exists, so people are like those kids are reading smut, but you should you should be monitoring your your kids' uh, 
like online activity to a certain extent. Yeah, I mean, I think parents just need to be more careful about like understanding that even if a book has like a cartoony cover, it might not be so cartoony inside. You know, like the teacher brought up icebreakers and I've heard that book is like very smutty and there's a lot of sex scenes in it. But like, I honestly think sex scenes are like are fine. (laughs) I mean, teenagers are going to be curious, but I am like, more concerned when it comes to like dark romance books which you know portray like abusive relationships and uh sometimes sexual assault and a lot of toxic you know masculinity crap and and it's just like yeah for for a young reader they might not understand that this is a sort of fantasy and uh these things in real life are not okay so, um, yeah, like Colleen Hoover is a very popular book talk author, but I would not recommend those books to middle schoolers or even like high schoolers. I would probably tell them to read something else. Yeah. But the fact that they're already reading them means it's too late for them. <laughs> they've already I know, they've I know. opened Pandora's box. Their minds have been irrevocable. I mean, think about yeah. like fourth graders reading Fifty Shades of Grey, you know, it's like they're learning about BDSM, but it's not really BDSM because it's not accurate at all. So, yeah. yeah, that's kind of how it feels. But neither of us are parents, so I guess I, I guess we don't really have skin in the game. So, yeah, I'm curious to hear everybody else's thoughts. Uh, please share on our Discord if you guys are Patreon members. Like, what are your thoughts on uh, illustrated covers on spicy books? Do they, quote unquote, corrupt the youth? Where does the fault lie? Where is the line? Very curious to hear your thoughts. All right. Before we call an episode, um, like I mentioned, I did attend the 2024 Festival of AAPI Books in Long Beach um, a couple of weeks ago. And I was able to capture some audio from some of the vendors as well as attendees um, to give their book recommendations. So yeah, for the next few minutes, please enjoy the sounds of the 2024 Festival of AAPI Books. Hi, this is Riza from San Diego, and I really recommend the book The Night Tiger by Yang Chi Chu. My name is uh, Hyun Su Moon, and uh, my book recommendation would be uh, If I Were the Ocean, I Would Carry You Home by Pete Su, a really beautiful collection of uh, short stories uh, about identity and uh, growing up. Um, <laughs> the author might disagree a little bit, but that's how I see it. So, but uh, really, it's a beautiful collection of short stories, and you should definitely read it. Hi, uh, my name is Irving Ruan, and I'm coming in from Los Angeles. My book recommendation is Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zevin. And the reason why I love it is because I think it's a very sweet journey and story about a creative partnership and the ups and downs of it that I feel we don't get to read quite often. And it features Asian American characters and it's about an industry that we don't know much about, which is the video game industry. And that's why I love it. Hi, my name is Kathy and I'm actually coming all the way from Oakland, California. Um, And my book recommendation is My Father, the Panda Killer. Hi, I'm Jessica Kim. I'm from Seattle, Washington. And my book recommendation is The Mermaid from Jeju Island. Hi, my name is Kathy. I'm from Orange County, California, and I'd like to recommend Strange Beasts of China by Yan Ge. Um, It's a magical realism book, and it is a bunch of interconnected stories, and I love it all. Okay, I'm Jennifer Hong, and I grew up in the Los Angeles area. So I created a small publishing press called Heritage Press, and we specialize in bilingual children's books. So um, when I became a mom, it was really hard to find books for my babies and toddlers in Korean and English. Um, So I started with a picture dictionary that could kind of, you know, serve a lot of... um, new parents because they could teach their kids different words and in my case Korean and English and now we have like Mandarin and English in various languages and then now we're starting to create a new line of songbooks as well catered to the baby and toddler years. 
So for from our press, I think the first 100 words is a really great starter book for any newborn. It's a really popular kind of baby shower gift. Um, and we use real pictures because I think that's really effective for that age. And um, we create song books because songs are catchy. Um, they will remember it throughout the years. And it just also rekindles a lot of childhood memories as well. Um, and I was just telling your wife that last year I met one of my favorite Asian American authors, um, Min Lei. And there's a book called Drawn Together that I love. It talks about a boy kind of visiting his grandparent, um, his grandfather in particular, and they have this big divide because they have a cultural divide. They can't speak each other's language and they find that uh, common ground through drawing and they have this connection, which I feel is reminds me a lot of my child's generation, their third generation Korean American, and kind of the divide between them and connecting with their grandparents' generation. So I would highly recommend that book. And that'll do it for this episode of Books and Boba. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Um, a quick reminder that our May 2024 book club pick is Kill Her Twice by Stacey Lee, a YA noir murder mystery about a pair of sisters investigating the death of their friend, a Chinese-American movie star in 1920s L.A. Chinatown. Yeah, I'm really enjoying this book so far. If you are a Patreon supporter, feel free to join our weekly read-along over on Discord, where we're, um, each week we're reading about a third of the books. So this week we'll be reading up to, I think, chapter 32? Lots of twists and turns so far. We're really excited to chat with you about this um, at the end of the month, Rira. Uh, Yeah, yeah. And also, just don't spoil the book for for people uh, who are reading ahead. I mean, sorry, sorry, sorry. And for those of you who have already finished a book or are reading ahead, please be careful of spoiling the book for people in Discord. <laughs> yeah, definitely appreciate that. But um, with that, thank you so much for listening to our May 2024 mid-month episode. Um, thank you, Rira, for compiling all the book news this month. Um, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks for listening to Books and Boba. This podcast was hosted by Marvin Yue and Rira Yu and edited and produced by Marvin Yue. Follow the book club on Twitter and Instagram by going to at Books and Boba and engage with us on Goodreads on our Goodreads group. You can also check out past episodes of the podcast by going to booksandboba.com and by subscribing to us on your favorite podcast app. Don't forget, you can support Books and Boba and Asian American authors by purchasing books at our bookshop.org account. Check out the link in our show notes and also at booksandboba.com. Books and Boba is a proud member of the Potluck Podcast Collective, a collective of Asian American hosted podcasts featuring unique voices and stories from the Asian diaspora. Learn more about the collective and check out our fellow Potluck shows by visiting the website podcastpotluck.com. Thanks for listening. Hey, I'm Bill Yu, and you may know me from a blog called Angry Asian Man. And I'm Jeff Yang, author, journalist, and celebrity dad. We host a podcast called They Call Us Bruce, an unfiltered conversation about what's happening in Asian America. Each week or so, we host a discussion about some of the most vital and interesting topics in our pop culture and our community, bringing in guests who are shaping and informing this thing called Asian America from Hollywood to D.C. and beyond. Uh, we got media, entertainment, food, family, politics, representation, the good, the bad, the WTF of it all. So check us out wherever you get your podcasts or at theycallsbruce.com. Peace. Peace. Peace.